think it works. Okay, uh, welcome, good afternoon, uh, good evening, actually, and um, welcome again to Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory Tuesday Seminar Series. And today we have uh, with us in person, a uh, real person, um, Dr. Etienne Bachelet, uh, who uh, did his PhD in, in Toulouse and in France, and in his origin from France, and then he did his postdoc in Qatar. And then he worked for six and a bit years for uh, LCO, La Sombras Observatory in Dolita, uh, where we actually had the pleasure to work together. And, and now uh, he's uh, actually moving from IAP in Paris to start his new job uh, in Caltech and IPAC uh, NASA in Los Angeles. So Ken's going to tell us about the Omega project on my Okay, thank you very much, Gash. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to present our results from the Omega project, which is a project that runs for almost two and a half, two and a half now. And of course, this work uh, is not only me, it's made with a lot of colleagues all around the world. So thank you to them too. Uh, so I will start my talk by um, speaking a bit about the basics of microprocessing. But I know here you're very familiar with it, so I will not go too much in details. And then I will present the Omega Key project. Uh, what do we do and why do we do this? And I will present some of the early results and uh, what the plans for the future will be. So, microlensing occurs in the form of gravitational lensing that occurs when uh, a lens, um, typically a body of uh, up to a few solar mass, cross the line of sight between the Earth and the distant source, generally the star. And uh, when the alignment between the three bodies is sufficiently small, then the gravitational field of the lens will amend the path of the uh, photons coming from the source and create several images uh, of this source. And as soon as the lens leaves the line of sight, the phenomenon has stopped. This is due to the proper motion of the street body. And we speak about microlensing because generally, as I said previously, be our lens are up to two solar masses, so the typical size of the angular standard radius is of the order of milliards. So, as a consequence, the separation between yeah. the image is also of the order of milliards. And basically, that means the image are not resolvable with our current facilities. So, the only observable we really see is the magnification of the source, and this is what is displayed here on, on, the, on the right. So this is a brightness observed from the source, there's a sign, and uh, we can see that when the lens getting closer to the line of sight, then the, the source uh, flux increase, and when the lens leaves the line of sight, then the uh, lens uh, flux decrease. So uh, microlensing, therefore, is a transient event, and we really want to cover well this light curve to be able to reconstruct the property uh, of the lensing system. Uh, one of the, the use we made of microlensing is to detect cold planets, as I will discuss later, because if there is a planet orbiting the lens, then the planet itself uh, can play uh, 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 the role of a small lens and create its own magnification. This is the blip here in the light curve. And uh, we really want to monitor this and only very good to be able to reconstruct the uh, planetary property. So one of the uh, first observable in microlensing is the uh, event duration, which is called uh, TE, the Einstein time scale uh, of the event, and it's proportional to the square root of the mass of the lens. So for typical event toward uh, the galactic verge, um, a lens of one solar mass, let's say, the duration will be around uh, one month or something like this. And the same rule apply for a planetary anomaly. Uh, the, the duration of the anomaly is scaling with the mass of the planet. So for a typical Jupiter planet, the duration of the anomaly is order of one or two days. And for a super Earth, uh, the, uh, the duration is an order of few hours. So again, uh, since it's transient, we really want to uh, observe very densely this light curve to be able to reconstruct uh, the property of the lensing system because uh, Contrary to the other method of detection, we are sensitive to the uh, gravitational field of the lens. We don't need to observe photons coming directly from it. 
Of course, if we can measure flux coming from the net, it helps to constrain models. But uh, basically, we are sensitive to a large gam of host uh, going from uh, what we call free floating planets, which are planetary body mass um, without host uh, navigating in the galaxy, up to uh, stellar remnant plates such as uh, Isolated Stellar Mass uh, So, here I make an animation of the phenomena. On the bottom uh, left, uh, I put a lens fixed at zero, zero. And I had a source trajectory here. This is a light shade circle. Um, and uh, when the source getting closer to the lens, it creates two image. So this is a sample case of a single lens and a uh, single lens and single source. So two images are created, and the closer I get the source to the lens, the more uh, the image are distorted and they are getting bigger. And since my can conserve the brightness of the source. This uh, creates this magnification like your uh, as I explained before. Another phenomena that we observe more and more these days is called uh, astrometric microlensing. This is what I display here in unit of uh, Einstein ring. This is actually the uh, trajectory of the center of light relative to the source trajectory. And so the lens system induces uh, uh, a shift in the position of the light center. And actually, uh, if you have precise astrometry, you can uh, follow this trajectory, and this gives you uh, a very strong constraint on the racing system because the photometric shift is directly proportional to as the Einstein beam radius uh, of the Einstein beam radius theta e, which is the first one of the first mass distance relation we want to have to be able to uh, measure the mass and uh, distance of the lens. So I will come back to this uh, very uh, soon, but uh, I like um, when I start my talk because I said we can't observe the image individually. This was true uh, uh, until recently because uh, people start to use interferometers at VMT to be able to observe directly the images uh, with method. So it had begun uh, by Dongeta uh, with gravity on the planetary event. And by Cassandra using Pionier uh, on the Gaia Planet BLD uh, event that you uh, know well in this century. So, thanks to new facility, we are now able to obtain a measurement of theta e directly by interferometry, but also with uh, the measurement of photocenter shift. So, uh, this is a technique that was used by Linton to uh, confirm uh, Einstein relativity in 1919, but more recently it has been used. Uh, to measure the mass of white dwarf with HST by Sao et al. and McGill et al., where they follow uh, the path of star in front uh, of a white dwarf to measure uh, the mass of the white dwarf. It also has been done with Proxima Centauri uh, by Zogo et al. on VLT to measure again uh, the mass. And also, it has been used uh, with Gaia for the uh, astrometry time series. So here I display the Gaia 16 AYE. Uh, light curve published by Wukash in uh, 2020. And on the bottom, uh, this is a plot made by Chris Ribicki, where uh, they were able to collect uh, the Gaia 1D astrometry. And we can see that uh, the data from Gaia can only be matched uh, when the lensing model is added. So this is a direct measure of uh, the photometric shift from Gaia. And they were, uh, Chris were able to measure directly to tell you from the data. We found, I think, three milliards ago, which is in good agreement uh, with uh, other methods uh, we can use uh, using the photometry model. So nowadays we live in, a, in an area where uh, astrometric microlensing is going to be very important because they're going to bring a very strong constraint on a lot of events. And uh, more recently, this has been done to uh, detect the first isolated stellar mass black hole in the Milky Way. Uh, this has, was done by uh, Sauita, Lamita, and uh, Shemek Mozeta, um, where the study is a light curve from 1 2011 uh, BHD 191. You can see here the dense coverage of the light curve by several observatories uh, from Brown. So combining this data, uh, this photometric data with uh, high precision photometry, uh, astrometry, sorry, from HST. Here I display 80 meters at eight different epochs. 
you can obtain a direct measurement of the astrometric shift. This is here in the right ascension and here declination. And so, thanks to astrometry, you can measure theta e, and since photometry measures the parallax, and combining this with data, um, the, the authors were able to uh, find that the length is a uh, certain uh, solar mass black hole at two kiloparsecs uh, from the Earth. But of course, we can also uh, discover, discover planets with micro -NC. So here I display uh, the demographic of, planet, of planets from NASA to planet of Cal. On left, I display the mass of planet versus uh, the distance to the post star normalized by the snow line. And the, we can see that the transit and relevant city methods are very sensitive to planets orbiting inside the snow line of the system. And thanks to these two methods, we have now a very good knowledge of this planet demographics. But uh, these two methods are less sensitive after the snow lines. Uh, and, but fortunately, this is where micro and direct imaging are the most sensitive. So we can see on this diagram that all methods of detection are very complementary. And um, we can use all of them to have a very good understanding of the planetary population. And on the right, I display the position of this planet in the Milky Way. And in brown, it's micro -lensing. You can see that this is currently our best method to discover planets several to parsec away. And therefore, it's a very good tool to explore the planet population of the Milky Way. Uh, for this reason, oh, sorry. Um, and since we don't need to measure um, light coming from the lens itself, we can find an uh, interesting system difficult to detect with other methods. Uh, here is an example more 2010 uh, 477, which is an event I published during my PhD. You can see that the light curve shows uh, various anomalous features, which was which is due to uh, a binary uh, lens made of uh, one mass Jupiter planet around 0.5. Uh, solar mass cost, but at the time of the original study, we were not able uh, to conclude about the nature of the cost. Uh, but uh, George Blackman et al. in 2021 published a follow up study where they used cake uh, to make a high resolution imaging around the target. So here is an image from 2015 and here 2018. So the source star is this right here, uh, bottom right. And on top left, you can see another star, but it's not the lens, it's actually an unrelated star blend. And uh, between the two years, they were, uh, the three years, sorry, they were not able to find any light coming from the lens because model, photometric models predict the lens to be here or here. And so they conclude that the was is actually uh, dark. Uh, and so this system is one of the first uh, Jupiter mass planet uh, that orbits uh, white work discovered. And for all of this reason, uh, NASA decided uh, 10 years ago to uh, conduct a micro survey with the Roman uh, space mission. So here I display uh, on left uh, the mass of planet versus semi major axis from simulation of Pini et al. And we can see in blue the prediction of Roman in comparison to what Kepler did uh, 10 years ago. And we can see that after the completion, of Roman mission, we're going to have a very good census of the planet uh, that orbit beyond the snow line, what for the cold planets. And after the completion of the mission, uh, we're going to have a very good understanding of the demographics of planets. So, on the right, I display the field of view of uh, Roman, which is in red, which is about 100 times bigger than HST in blue here. So, Roman mission will be uh, five years, 70 day windows toward the galactic bulge. It will be sensitive to all host type and will be stellar remnants. We can expect 30,000 micro events. Uh, that includes about 1,400 planets, uh, hundreds of frequenting planets, although the number is not very well known since the population is uh, not known yet in the Milky Way. And of course, we're going to have uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of binary stellar remnants, one dwarf, ultimately. That will give a very simple constraint of the mass function uh, of the Milky Way. Uh, so I close the uh, parenthesis about the Roman now and I come back to my original subject, which is the new potential for micro thanks to a new generation of all sky surveys, such as Gaia or ZTF, 
we are going to detect uh, thousands, if not millions, of uh, transient alerts every night in the entire sky. It will be uh, even more with uh, the upcoming ES distribution. Here I display uh, simulation by Sadijan et al. of the number of microlensing event uh, simulation in the Milky Way. So here it's uh, uh, galactic latitude versus galactic longitude. And it is color coded as a log number of events per degree square per year. And for the simulation, it is clear that the SST should be able to detect uh, thousands of microns in events in the entire sky, with of course uh, planets, uh, stellar remnants, etc. So, a lot of this event would be uh, absolutely interesting to uh, study. But all of this new, new large mission have the same issue for microns in is. Uh, because they have a so big coverage of the sky, their sampling is relatively low. So here, for example, I display uh, the first year of DTF coverage by Bem et al. And we can see that in the most covered region, we can expect to have uh, dozens of points per week, which is uh, a bit too small um, for the proper characterization of the system. So to overcome this problem, we developed the Omega project that started in 2020, and we will end the uh, next July. And the goal is to ensure dense photometric and uh, spectroscopic follow-up of the most microlensing candidates. And it's a collaboration between the Las Palmas Observatory and several institutions around the world. Briefly, Las Palmas Observatory is a network of robotic telescopes that work in a uh, in uh, the same uh, architecture and infrastructure, and it's composed of uh, 20 one meter telescope and uh, uh, about 12.4 telescope, uh, sorry, 40 centimeter telescope, and as well as two uh, telescope. And really, this is a network where you want to uh, observe a star, it will automatically select uh, the best telescope and site and submit observation to. Uh, to this site automatically and give you back the data 15 minutes after uh, the shutter is closed. So our observing strategy is consisting in two parts. The first one is to perform uh, a photometric follow-up with different modes. The first one is regular mode, which is a daily cadence uh, for every ongoing event. And if any event starts to get uh, sensitive to planets, we increase the cadence to 30 minutes for the next three days. If, and if an anomalous mode, an anomaly is detected in the light field, we can trigger a very intensive follow up for the next 48 hours. We also want to trigger for spectroscopy because we observe events in the disk and the, the distance to the source is not well known. So, spectroscopy is very important for us, and we can trigger uh, two kinds of spectra. Uh, for the faintest target, we can trigger uh, low resolution spectra or fluids. And if the target gets bright, we can have uh, high resolution in the spectra uh, if it's brighter than 11 mile. So, to develop uh, this uh, observing strategy, we uh, deploy the microlensing observing platform, which is a combination of a ton toolkit. Database, which is a software solution developed by DCO to uh, create a database that aggregates thousands of uh, positions in the sky and depending on some criteria that you can set up, it can trigger automatic observation on the SEO network as well as some, uh, some uh, frame telescopes that we will discuss later. And one of the specificity of MOP is to be deployed on the Amazon Web Service. It's not sure uh, to have a very reliable database, and we don't need to take care of any of the hardware problems. And of course, we uh, took the experience from the last key project, especially Aurora and Robonet, uh, to implement codes uh, in this micro signal time platform. So, the goal of MOP is uh, to do all the steps I described before. First task is to uh, collect the candidates from the various survey and brokers, such as Google, MOA, Assassin, etc. Put that in a common database and collect the photometry. Then we can fit with the Pinea software and run them uh, using the capability of AWS to be able to do this in massively parallel. And when the ranking of event is done, uh, depending on the need, uh, extra follow-up data can be triggered automatically to SEO. 
And uh, after the completion of the data, uh, of the observation, data are available in 15 minutes. Then we can process the photometry uh, with our PIA pipeline and re-adjust the photometry in MOP in order to uh, be able to reassess the urban priority uh, since the new data can change the, the ongoing model. So the goal is of course to combine all of these data together to try to make a new science of it. So here I present an example uh, when an alert was triggered by the Gaia Net Index. Uh, Bob collected uh, about one or two hours after the alert and triggered extra observation. And actually, we get our first data four hours after uh, the, the alert was collected. So here is a map of all the events that are now uh, in, at least in the database in MOC, not especially all observed, depend on our uh, observing strategy. So we have 14 events towards the Gallic Verge, this is where the, the micro-intimity event rate is the highest, so that's not surprising. We have about 400 in the disk, six towards the managing cloud. Uh, we monitor 500 of them in photometry, we collect 100 spectra, and about 10% of them, uh, we classify them as events of interest. And so there are planets, uh, binary lengths, or uh, relevant candidates. So now I will uh, present some of uh, them. First one will be uh, Gaia 20 Boss. It was an event uh, triggered by Gaia about two years ago. And uh, I think the earlier for around this day, and we triggered. Um, Mob trigger follow up of this event, and we catch this plateau here. Actually, this plateau is due uh, to a binary lens. We were able to collect spectra from each shooter and salt. This is uh, salt in black and each shooter in red. And if we do uh, template shading, uh, we are able to find that the, the, the source star is actually a, a sub red giant uh, of probably 10 to the year. And when we use this property from spectroscopy and coupled with gaia photometry here in blue, we found that the distance of the source is probably around uh, two kilo per sec. That match very well uh, estimation from gaia uh, in black parallax. So maybe it's slightly uh, underestimate for gaia because this event has a blend. So the blend can uh, push uh, the gaia parallax measurement a bit away, but overall it's a pretty good uh, agreement. So for this model like here, we found uh, six degenerate models. Uh, here is a list, all of them. Uh, the mass ratio Q between the binary component uh, tends to uh, equal mass binary, except for the original case is it's about 5% uh, mass ratio. That means this event is likely, uh, if this model are correct, uh, at the ground graph uh, massive planet boundary. So the question will be uh, how in the future we're going to be able to distinguish between all of this model. One of, one of the first way could be that um, all of them have slightly different prediction in terms of uh, propulsion. So in 10 years, using high resolution imaging, we should be able to distinguish um, uh, the models that are not compatible uh, with the observation. And another way is to study uh, the prediction of uh, Gaia astrometry. So here I display the six model from the table before. Uh, it's in blue, it's the trajectory of the source relative to the lens, uh, placed at zero, zero. In red, it's the caustic uh, system of the binary system. And uh, in the middle and the right, it's the uh, uh, astrometric signal uh, that are predicted by this model. It's color coded with gaia magnitude, so yellow is 15.6 and um, purple is 14.6. And we can see that all of this model, so it's in unit of Einstein radius. So if the Einstein radius is sufficiently large, we should be able to see uh, different, we should be able to use data from gaia to uh, distinguish between all of this model. Another result uh, that you may already have heard is Gaia 21 DNC. It's uh, an event uh, that is currently studied by Mike Coban. And uh, the alert from Gaia was done around uh, 9420. 
And here we collect data from the regards of descent of wheat. But as I seen in uh, ZPF, they were able to catch the planetary anomaly here. And when we couple all of the data together, we find only one solution with mass ratio of 10 to the minus 3. So this event is definitely a planetary event in the disk uh, with the planet mass. So we currently have two different models because the source distance is not well estimated yet. So we have two different solutions, but the planetary mass uh, remains almost the same in this, uh, let's say, one transmitter. Here is another example of uh, recent result we get. Uh, this event was uh, MOA 2022 BHG 462, and it starts to get very high max. So Omega trigger uh, follow up observation, as we can see here. We get a very dense coverage of the peak where we are missing data. And when we use the data in modeling, this is done by Valerie Bozza. Uh, we found that again this uh, mass ratio of uh, 0.3 percent. That means this event is uh, another planetary event that we catch this year. I will also discuss about Gaia 18 CBF, which was um, published by Katarina Kuzmiska this year. Uh, this is a very long event with a uh, um, Einstein time ring of 500 days. So this uh, tends to uh, we can think that the lens is very massive, but uh, also, but also the parallax is small. So there's two information uh, tends to our very massive lens, and because there is no blend light measure at all, uh, that means there is a very uh, strong probability that uh, that this lens is actually a stellar remnant. This is what is displayed here. Uh, most probable scenario is. Uh, a stellar remnant has less than five kilos. So we have uh, much more reason to go. Uh, here I make a list of events, but I didn't want to get to all of them that uh, we are currently studying. So we, we observe a lot of events, so maybe we have data on some events that can interest you, so like us. And we are preparing for the next call in 2023. Um, uh, this will be next year, and we are uh, preparing for uh, the first type of LSST. In the context of LSST, uh, I will uh, conclude my talk by speaking about AON, which is the Astronomical Event Observatory Network. So it's a collaboration between uh, the Las Vegas Observatory, the SOAR Telescope in Chile, and Gemini uh, Telescopes. The idea is to build a common network of uh, telescopes uh, of different aperture and instrument to be able to uh, realize uh, uh, um, an adaptive follow-up of uh, alerts made by LSST in a common ecosystem and network uh, using uh, automated solutions such as API and uh, Tom system. So this system is starting to grow. Uh, this year, because we have preliminary uh, agreement with uh, the Milan Comish Telescope and all our SST contributors, there is discussion ongoing with SWIFT as well as with all 10 meter telescopes to join this ALM group. And uh, we are looking for uh, more participants. And uh, this will be uh, the end of my talk. It's a bit short, but it's for 10 and a half, so I thought it was okay. For me. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you. And uh, do I get it correctly that you have uh, any other network connected to the uh, to work? Uh, yes, so. You, you need to have a time access to, let's say, software or Gemini. But after that, there is a tool developed in Tom systems to submit automatic observation uh, to us. Uh, so, Gemini did them. Thank you. Following on this, so the Milan Tom telescope, where is it and what is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it looks kind of Smallish, like one and a bit, right? Yeah. And uh, who is operating this? 
Uh, I think it's very interesting to register. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's actually a very random information for many people to yeah. know which events have your thing. Yeah. Right. So that then probably you don't run it as you do to check it. Any more questions? Comments? So you mentioned you have six investors, majority of us. Uh, are, are all of them genuine? Ah, uh, all of them what? Are all of them, are all of them doing my kinds of events or just something? Uh, I have to uh, go through it and, and uh, check them carefully. I'm pretty sure they are not all my kinds of events. But I think from what I recall, there is one or two which are not true. The one you showed the yeah, 21 H A H R is definitely not like yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it's one of the other ones. No, it's not. It's, not. Okay. it's clearly not. But I know this one was not my currency, but I just wanted to show the reactivity of the system. We are currently building a new classifier because we collect all Gaia events now, and we, we want to make a migrancy classifier and move to the chain. And uh, this guy at point A, which are I use, which not the So you mean classify which decides which events to enter into your system? No, we, we, we decided now we collect everything and then we give a classification uh, that automatically and that prevents the observation of uh, things. This is going to be relevant for uh, LSST, I guess. And also for Gaia, because so, Gaia so far is giving you a hint that this could be like a right? Yeah, that will stop some, so you. Mm -hmm. So you will have to do it yourself. Okay. So for this, this uh, question is slightly different because there is a uh, few protocols that have developed, like uh, Fink in France or Alerce in Chile or uh, Paris, uh, that do classification for us. So they work all the alerts or they survey German and machine learning algorithm that already cross match with Steam by for example. And they, they do a lot of work that. We don't need to, just need to, to plug to the system and take uh, whatever our lights are going to us. Any more questions? I have a question about the next call for the Omega Kick project. Do you know more about the details where it is uh, published open, maybe the call, or what is the status of this? Project? You mean about uh, the status of the key project? Or for, the, for, the, for the call? The call. Yeah. The call. Yeah. 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 Do you know the date? Yeah, I think it's 20 January 2023. It's then. Yeah, the deadline for submitting meta of invention. Uh, but uh, to be able to uh, submit a key project to SEO, you need to be a, a partner institute. Yes, or, sure. uh, sure. at least one of the members. Okay. Mm -hmm. More questions? Right. I will have one uh, since we have time. So you showed the, the white work found uh, by on, on your event, mm -hmm. uh, actually. So, um, and Keck, even though it's big, so it wasn't able to see the white work. Was it too faint or too far? Why is it still, you know, I mean, in Black Man's paper, why is it still assumed it's a, it's a white one? Um, because, because you have some constraints from parallax from this model, but it's a bit weak. Uh -huh. But you have, um, you, have a, you have a limit. You have, for, first of all, you have a stay measurement, okay? So that gives you a, a bounded area of possibility. And then, the other one is going from uh, the, the non detection that puts you that for many sequence you should see it being made or not. So, if you follow this theta constraint plus the fact that you don't see it, then we sort of because only we have a weak parallax measurement, 
that tend us to a complex allowance. Okay. But if you add that with the measurement of non measurement of okay, the only solution is a white dwarf. So, how far is the length? I don't know. It's, uh, I think it's two kilometers. And you, you cannot see a white dwarf at two kilometers, even with the same number. No. J F is still incorrect, and you will not see. Well, let's say how many papers. How far can you see in the distance? Well, if that's that's relevant for all the lenses, right? Maybe ELT. ELT in ultraviolet, maybe, right? Maybe. Okay. Right, I don't see any more questions here there, so let's thank our speaker. Thank our speaker for having there soon. We'll have to join us, please. Thank you.